Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Gemma Bolton, I'm a member of Labour's National Executive Committee and I'm pleased to be part of this event bringing together people to look at the deepening cost of living crisis and what the alternatives are. Um, I'm pleased to say that well over 500 people have registered in advance for this event and sure thousands more will be joining us on social media. Um, and this event could not come at a more vital time. It's just one week after that non-event of a Queen's speech and the cost of living crisis is deepening by the day. But the Tories, they seem more interested in corporate profits than our health, jobs and livelihoods. So we need today to look not only at the extent of the crisis, but what can be done to resist it and what the economic alternative is that puts people first. We were at a crossroads. You know, it was only a few months ago it seemed that the party was over for Boris Johnson, yet there he still is in office overseeing a disastrous fall in people's living standards. So we're clear here today that he still needs to go and that at this vital time, we will build a massive movement that can resist and defeat the whole rotten Tory ruling class offensive on our health, rights, jobs and livelihoods. And can help win the urgent action people need now to tackle this crisis. From the proposed national insurance hike to the recent universal credit cut to the failure to take action on rocketing fuel, food and fuel bills, it's clear the Tories are the same old nasty party. They're more interested in doing the bidding of their rich bankers than what is needed for people across the country. The Tories have used the pandemic to further restructure the economy in the interests of the super rich, whilst attacking our right to resist, and now an even bigger class war from the ruling elite against the overwhelming majority of us is coming, both on an economic front and in terms of further attacks on our rights. So on the left, it's a vital time that we must be at the heart of organising and amplifying the voices of all these strands of the progressive anti-Tory resistance against this Tory offensive. And we're here today to not only say we mustn't let them get away with it, but also to say there is an alternative that puts people before corporate greed and that we can win it. And importantly, to outline what that radical socialist agenda we need is in terms of an alternative economic agenda. And so as this session goes on, please just post your questions in the comments below the stream if you're watching on YouTube and the Q&A section on Zoom. And we're going to put some of those to the panel. And please tell us where you're tuning in from and also tell us what key policies you believe should be part of the left's economic alternative. Please also donate at the link provided so Arise can continue to host these really important events and support other campaigns and links that are going to be put in the chat throughout the event, uh, including sharing the stream of this event on Twitter and Facebook so even more people can tune in and listen to our brilliant speakers. So our speakers for this part of the discussion are going to introduce um, for about eight minutes and then we'll move on to the questions. Um, I'm delighted now to move on to our first speaker, who's a little introduction. Uh, he's uh, a Member of Parliament for Hemsworth, so very welcome uh, to John Trickett. Thanks, Gemma. I need to uh, unmute myself before I try to speak. And uh, thanks to Arise, as always, for organising these important events. Thanks to everybody who's come along to join us in what in Yorkshire is an absolutely beautiful early summer evening. So uh, thanks very much. Well, look, uh, I think the when the governor of the Bank of England, hardly the most radical member, <laughs> citizen of the UK, says the coming rises in food prices are apocalyptic. And when the CBI says to the government, there's a moral imperative to help people who are facing real hardship now. And then when you hear senior police officers linking poverty to rising crime, then you know something is happening in our country. And of course, it's evident everywhere that there is a huge crisis uh, taking place. Now, the Tories want to pretend <clears throat> this crisis is down to international uh, problems, Ukraine, supply chain issues, COVID, and so on and so forth. Of course, those are all factors. But the truth is the underlying problems of our economy and our society <clears throat> have been ongoing much longer than that. In some ways, the whole economic trajectory which the country's taken has been wrong from the start, really decades of um, what we all call neoliberalism. And it sometimes seems to me like there's a slow motion car crash been happening for a while, certainly since the banking uh, collapse in 2008, but that the car aiming for the war with all of us in it, or the vehicle, 
is actually accelerating now uh, with the current crisis, but the direction of travel was already decided, was already determined a long time ago. We saw the decline of incomes and the increasing wealth of the richest. And wherever you look in our country, there are endemic problems, whether it's land speculation, putting up house prices, food inequality and food insecurity, wealth not properly taxed, tax loopholes for the rich, for example, and I've said this several times, some of you may have heard it, the basic rate of income tax for if you work is 20%, but if you receive dividends from wealth, you only pay 7.5%, or if you gain, uh, if you have capital gains, it's 10%. So we tax, we tax wealth and income from wealth less than we tax work. And if you consider the profits of the privatized monopolies, 16.8 billion pounds in uh, the watch industry in the last decade, 147 billion pounds for Shell and BP. You know that something is happening in our society and has been for some time, which has set the direction of travel. Now, the Tories don't want to change what's happening, this kind of neoliberal orthodoxy. We heard two MP, Tory MPs last week, didn't we? One saying, well, the poor need to learn how to cook. And then a minister saying, well, the poor need to get another job. They need to get perhaps two jobs or even three or work more hours. But these are attitudes which are more akin to a kind of Victorian morality, a snobbery, blaming the victims, the poor, of a society which is truly unjust, rather than setting out to tackle the root causes. But it's more than just Tories looking down the noses at the poor, though that's dreadful, isn't it? It's ideological. And we heard on the radio today that there's a dispute between number and 10 and 11 about a... Um, about a tax on um, yeah, on the ener on energy suppliers, <clears throat> a windfall tax, and what was said it was on the BBC. It was quite surprising to hear the truth being spoken. Number ten, and particularly the Prime Minister, does not want a windfall tax because, for ideological reasons, because he doesn't want to see the government interfering or intervening in the market in price mechanisms or the distribution distributional effects of the market. This is an ideological position, and the crisis is as a result of a, a fixed idea in the Tories' mind about how the economy should work. Now, we can't accept that, and the British people, I'm sure, if we're able to explain to them where we need to be, we'll understand too. I think the left just need to say, look, there are some very, very, very simple things which we need to set as objectives. Everybody in a, in a wealthy country like ours should have a decent job. They should have a secure home which they can pay for and not always feeling that they're in trouble because of the rent or the mortgage. They should be able to afford the essentials of food and energy and so on and so forth. And they should be able to live a reasonable quality of life uh, up to the expectations of the 21st uh, of our 21st century. But, and this is the extraordinary thing. <clears throat> The underlying structures of British capitalism, as it's being constructed, actually make it very difficult for millions of our fellow citizens to guarantee a secure home or to have a decent job or to be able to pay for food and heating. We know that's the case. But when you put it in that way, you see how wrong the way our structures have been set up. Now, so where should the left be? <clears throat> and I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because other speakers will. My first point is this, the problems facing us are structural and therefore palliative measures, though we need some immediately because people are struggling to eat, but palliative me measures will not resolve the underlying problems. Tinking around at the edges, it's not going to do it. We need to change direction. We need to change the, our, our, the, our economic structures. A long-term strategy would talk, which the left needs to have, <clears throat> we'll talk about, does talk about a new kind of economy. We need to develop new ideas and policies, but much of what needs to be done, we already know. We need to tax wealth. We need, in my view, something like a Marshall Aid style plan to rebuild all those communities that have been devastated and, and to help those individuals living in poverty everywhere in our country. We need a new deal for workers, including trade union rights which allow people to fight back against the bosses 
and we re re need to refinance the public services, which have been running to ground. So that implies an end to austerity. And finally, on my little list, public ownership, especially of those privatised monopolies. And think about it, the billions of pounds that have gone to shareholders from those privatised monopolies, if they were publicly owned, would go back into the public purse and allow us to achieve social objectives, a measure of social justice. My final point is this. In a society which is profoundly unjust, which we all see around us every day, there will be a rising tide of political and community resistance, possibly, and, and workers in uh, the place of work as well, possibly on a large scale. The left's job is to express solidarity, to give uh, support, but also to show that the, we can connect these struggles together with a set of ideas which explain what's happened to our society. The Tories know what's coming. They're preparing for it. You look at the legislation on Monday, empowering the police and the state generally to take action against people who dissent from the way our country is coming. They know what's coming. The legislation in the last parliament, in the last session of parliament, cracking down on dissent, enhancing the power of the state and the repressive arms of the state. They're ready for it. We need to be too. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. Um, very inspiring. Um, our next, um, before we go on to our next speaker, actually, we have an important message from our media partner of Arise Festival, um, Patrick Foley from Labour Outlook. Welcome, Patrick. Hi, Gemma. Thanks for um, thanks for calling me. Um, so I'll get straight into it. Uh, I'm Patrick from Labour Outlook, and I'm actually here to ask for your support today uh, for our media platform. So if you don't know us, um, Labour Outlook, Labour Outlook is an alternative media platform that brings you positive news, views and, and analysis from the left and amplifies the voices of socialists, progressives, uh, frontline struggles uh, against the Tories and, and movements of international solidarity as well. Um, and we've, we're, a, we're a new platform and we, we've been growing every day and we've been building um, a very regular readership, but we need your help to keep, keep pushing and to, um, and to keep building our platform. Um, and I've, I'm happy to announce that, we can, that you can now support us on Patreon. So for those of you who don't know, Patreon is a, is a platform where you can, um, in, as individuals, you can support creators or uh, media outlets uh, personally, and you can have a bit more of a, a um, interactive touch with them, uh, get in contact with the team behind behind Labour Outlook and, and speak to us directly, as well as a few other things, and just be be involved with with our with our um, with our work, amplifying these these important voices. Um, so links are going to be posted in the chat from our volunteers uh, while I'm speaking. So please kind of, uh, keep an eye out. Um, so yeah, so please sign up on Patreon. I, I, it's uh, patreon.com slash labor outlook. I, I'd Im implore you all to go and have a look uh, today uh, once you're off this call or, or even during. Um, and by doing that, you're gonna help us really build our platform, reach new audiences every day. And it's for less than 10 pound a month, your support will ensure that we can actually continue our work and continue promoting these struggles that are so often ignored by the rest of the media. Um, we're countering these sort of right-wing, increasingly racist narratives that are spun by the billionaire-owned press. But to do that takes resources, time and commitment. And we are only a very small voluntary-led team. Uh, and we, and we, need, we need financial support. So we need your support for hosting our website, uh, for, for staffing costs, um, from everything to a, a, a mailing list that goes up by the day. Um, to just the day-to-day -day running costs of, of keeping a, a media platform going. So we, we really need your support and, and um, I'd, I'd just really, really urge you all to go to patreon.com slash labor outlook today. Um, if you can't afford to be a Patreon right now, that's okay too. There's, there are other ways you can support us. You can read Labour Outlook. We have, a like I said, a regular readership now. Um, people have spoken to me in person, say they check the site every day. So we're really delighted about that. Um, you can talk to people about Labour Outlook you know, in the, in the world of social media, the word of mouth really does count. Um, and of course, you can share, you can follow and you can support us online. Um, and thanks to so many of you, our reach has grown incredibly since, since we were founded um, just a few years ago. But this is only the beginning. And the more people talk about us, the more people get involved, 
the bigger our platform is going to grow. And in turn, the more we can do to help those uh, on the front lines resisting the Tories every day. So um, thanks so much for, for listening. And um, yeah, please sign up on Patreon. Thanks, Gemma. Thanks, Patrick. And I think I can pass on the thanks from so many of us for all the great progressive reporting that uh, Labour Outlook has been doing. And if you can spare a bit of money, then please go and subscribe to the Patreon. But if you can't, then definitely engage with the great media that they're consistently putting out. Um, our next speaker um, is a, the professor of, a professor of Economics at the University of Greenwich. Um, so can we have a warm welcome for Uslam Anaran? Thank you, Uslam. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Labour Against Austerity and uh, Arise for organizing the event. It's such a crucial juncture and having me. Um, I want to start by reminding us all that the squeeze in workers' income uh, and the rise in profit share isn't new. Uh, wages have fallen right after the Great Recession and the years of austerity by the condemned government and its aftermath deepened the attack on wages. Uh, since then, nominal wages have been failing to catch up with the rise in prices year after year. And as we stand today, the real wage of many workers, uh, that is after adjusting for the rise in prices, are still lower than what they were before 2007. And mind you, this is coming on top of decades of undervalued wages of key workers in the care economy uh, and public services, among other crucial uh, sectors. Uh, and this is coming after uh, a squeeze in wages by an unleashed capital, thanks to neoliberal globalization, financialization, and most of all, uh, years of attack on our trade unions. Uh, the increase in household debt of the families who have been struggling to make ends meet in all these years adds to this squeeze. So the cost of living crisis of today isn't new, but its current scale is the deepest in a generation. So on top of all these, we have now the new problems of the supply chain disruptions after the pandemic and the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, both hitting food prices and energy prices, which constitute a large share in the essential consumption basket of working class households. In the meantime, the profits and the wealth of the super rich at the top 1% have recovered well from all these crises. So let's get things right. Inflation today is an outcome of competing claims over the distribution of income between labor and capital. And currently capital is winning this game. The profit share of the capitalists are protected while workers share in income is being squeezed by the increase in the cost of energy and other inputs. And one of the key policy makers to, to deal with all this, the Bank of England's governor says workers have to pay for this crisis by capping, moderating their wage demands. Well, I say, we say, the trade unions say, the labor movement say, it doesn't have to be like this. Particularly after a decade of squeezing wages, it cannot be like this. Uh, the rich, the super rich have to pay for this crisis. Now, going back to Bank of England, the current actions of the Bank of England to tackle inflation is to increase the interest rate. But that won't cure the inflation of today's nature. Today's inflation is not driven by a rise in demand uh, of households and firms. It is pushed by a rise in input costs. And the rise in interest rate actually will not cure inflation, but it will just give more money to the wealthy, to the top 1% who already own the assets to benefit from this rise in interest rate. And there is a clear problem with the current mandate of the Bank of England as well. It is very narrowly targeting just inflation and on top of that targeting an inflation rate that is as low as possible. That's a major problem for workers because 
it always comes at a cost to workers, either in the form of increasing unemployment or, as in the case of Britain, a rise in at quality jobs and erosion in our working conditions and pay, like in the form of zero hour contracts and uh, wages that don't help people to make uh, a living. All this is labeled as the miraculous labor market flexibility. There is nothing in it for workers. This only helps the rentier who make profits by speculation and lending. Mind you, their income is the real rate of interest, which is the nominal interest rate right, minus inflation. So keeping that inflation as low as possible is a good target for the rentier. But when it comes in the uh, form of higher unemployment or more bad quality, bad, badly paid jobs, it is bad for workers. So what can be our alternatives? There are alternatives. And I'm going to try to distinguish between short run to medium run alternatives and the very short run just join a trade union today the best thing we can do is rebuild our trade unions and join the points against low wages fight for an increase in minimum wages first towards a 10 pound per hour and further towards a 15 pound per hour and yes we should be demanding these in the environment of increasing inflation this is the way to squeeze the profit margins. We have to fight for increasing public sector pay at a rate well above inflation. And of course, we have to address the issue of people who have to live on benefits because work doesn't pay. So we have to demand an increase in benefits by tying them to the retail price index. And we have to talk about price controls. Two things are at the forefront stop the next increase in energy prices and well if some gas suppliers energy suppliers uh fail just nationalize them the second thing to control in terms of prices of course is the price of rental uh housing uh why should the landlords always be able to enjoy uh a uh cap a, a matching indexing of their rental income to the rise in inflation uh, when we can't observe the sign for our wages, quite on the contrary, we need to have a cap on rent. Now, moving from this short run to the uh, next stage, here is an alternative also for the Bank of England, a different mandate to target full employment along with inflation and not just narrowly target inflation. So the Bank of England has to have a dual mandate with a higher weight on the employment target and a reasonable inflation target consistent with this full employment target, not as low as possible, not 2%. It could well be 4%, 5% inflation rather than as low as possible inflation that is not consistent with full employment target in the macro framework, and it only helps the rentier. In this alternative vision of the Bank of England's monetary policy mandate, monetary policy will be the small sister. It should accommodate an expansionary fiscal policy, public investment as far as part of a broader macro policy framework. And all that has to be accompanied by strong labor market institu institutions, ensuring that we can negotiate for wage increases in line with the target inflation. And mind you, when I say full employment targeting macro policy, I don't mean full employment with zero hours contracts. I mean full employment with decent jobs, decent wages, decent working conditions that requires strong collective voice, strong trade unions, and other strong labor market institutions, such as employment protection legislation. That brings me to a new paradigm, what I call the green, purple, red New Deal to tackle all the multiple crises we are facing, the ecological crisis, energy crisis, food crisis, care crisis, and multiple inequalities in class, gender, race, and across regions. If you want a magic bullet to hit all these targets uh, for a green, purple, red New Deal, we need public investment at a massive scale, 
Firstly, in green physical infrastructure that is in renewable energy, energy efficiency that is including insulation, in public transport, and in green social housing. Second important area of public investment is what we call the purple social infrastructure, that is the care economy. Now, how are we going to fund it? Public investment partly finances itself, but of course, we also need progressive taxation of not just income, but also wealth, particularly targeting the top 1%, the super rich. And this goes way beyond a one off or a limited windfall tax on only one sector, such as the energy, that is targeting all the wealth of the top 1%, uh, the richest, super rich uh, households in this country. Uh, and I'm talking about here net wealth, that is wealth assets minus the debt liabilities. That excludes the 99% of the households uh, in that sense. Now, this new deal, is the key to create a new paradigm, a new social uh, contract for decent green jobs, decent purple jobs, with decent wages, decent working conditions, with collective voice. It will be the key to provide the much needed universal basic services in education, from cradle to grave as the Labour Manifesto had uh, coined uh, in 2017, uh, from further education to childcare, uh, universal basic services in health, in social care, but also in energy, in public transport, in social housing. And these should be produced by publicly owned enterprises. The ownership is important. By publicly owned, I mean, broadly speaking, publicly as in, owned by the central government, depending on the sector, or local authorities, or cooperatives, simply collective public ownership. Uh, and of course, I have listed some sectors here, we have to also get real and start talking about the production and distribution of food uh, in cooperative collective modes against the domination of the food production and distribution by the so-called food billionaires and financial speculators, such funds basically speculating uh, over the hunger of working class households. Um, maybe uh, moving forward, talking about the key sectors for a new paradigm for a green, new, purple, uh, red, new deal, uh, we need to talk about finance as well. I'm gonna conclude by saying we need public banks, cooperative banks, national investment bank to mobilize the required investment. And moving from medium run to long run, we need democratic participatory planned economy, at least covering these key sectors. So we have the answers, let's organize and get it done. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was brilliant and fascinating. And um, can I say thanks to the hundreds of you joining from all over the place, even internationally. I've got Marlo Deptford from the Isle of Dogs, Farnborough from Woking, Hendon, all the way to Vancouver, to, from Rugby, North London, uh, Norfolk, Liverpool, Stroud, Tipperary, Brooklyn, Madrid, and Indonesia. So really global uh, with today's panel. It's the, the joy of, um, of going online. So thank you so much for everyone who's joined us. Uh, our next speaker, um, is a, is, a, is a Young Labour student rep. Uh, young Labour have again and again shown the way in socialism, in being progressive, um, really leading how the, how the Labour Party should be opposing the Tories, uh, in my opinion. So it's great to have you here. Um, very warm welcome to Nabila Molana. Welcome. Thank you very much, Gemma. Um, hello, everyone. It's really good to be with you all here today. Um, as Gemma mentioned, my name's Nabila and I'm from Young Labour. I'm also very privileged to have recently been elected the councillor for Park and Arbathon, which is my local ward in Sheffield. And if you've ever been up to Sheffield, you'll know that it's an incredible city. And I'm proud of the community I grew up in. But I'm also aware that depending on which side of the city you live in and which postcode your school had, you were either believed to be destined for greatness 
or you were considered lucky to get your GCSEs. So my school was turned into an academy. A year after I left, the local sixth form was shut down and a whole generation of young people were stripped of access to libraries, youth clubs, and in a lot of ways, opportunity. We know that young people today are the largest generation of private renters in this country, are most likely to be in precarious work, and those of us who are students are loaded with thousands of pounds of debt before we even enter the full-time job market. And in a lot of ways, it can feel like our future has been stolen. But this isn't something that has come out of nowhere. We know that this government has left working class people out to dry. They've raised our taxes while slashing our living standards. Because it's not Rishi Sunak or Boris Johnson who really pay the price of the cost of this crisis. We're the ones who are, you know, counting pennies and pounds at the end of the month, waiting for the next paycheck. We're the unpaid carers, the ones who pick up second jobs, the ones helping wherever possible, because we want our communities to survive this. But we also know that this crisis isn't inevitable. It's a product of privatized systems, which puts our ability to live at the mercy of global markets. Prizes are not set by workers or by consumers. They're set by firms owned by millionaires and billionaires. And that's why the energy company BP would rather have, and as they say, more money than they know what to do with, and let pensioners ride buses to stay warm, than let an entire nation heat their home. You know, we have Bank of England chiefs telling workers not to ask for a pay rise, whilst they pay themselves hundreds of thousands of pounds. And this is very much a war waged on the working class from the ruling elite. But in the face of all this, young Labour have seen time and time again that young people have shown us that we will organise a fight back because our ability to exist relies on it. So what is the economic alternative? The answer has to be a socialist one. Like we've heard today from our excellent speakers, young people desperately need a people's Green New Deal to take energy under public ownership, control prices and tackle the climate crisis. We need to tax the rich who got richer whilst the rest of us struggled through a global pandemic. Policies such as social housing, better conditions for apprentices, a living wage and a national education service shouldn't become forgotten manifesto pledges. They are promises that truly have the potential to change the lives of many. And, you know, from joining renters' unions to organising climate strikes, young people have shown that we won't wait for a Westminster handout from this government. So wherever you are in the country, there will be a community organising group. Join them. Join your trade union and remind your neighbours, your families, your colleagues that you know, there is real strength in numbers and we don't have to put up with things as they are. And if there isn't an active local group, then start one. We know our rights, but we also know that our rights aren't given. They are fought for and won. So young Labour, alongside our comrades in the trade union movement, Labour Assembly Against Austerity and community groups, you know, we can and must defend socialist policy. We will always stand with our comrades um, and help organise young people, whether that's in our workplaces, our communities and town halls, to raise our consciousness, but also raise our living standards. And I'm sure I've repeated this on calls before, but one of the greatest lessons from the labour movement for me is that we fight for bread, but we fight for roses too. And I really look forward to fighting for a world of roses um, with each and every one of you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nabila. And like massive congratulations on your elections council it's great to see more young people um being elected into local government which is wonderful uh next up uh we've got ben foley is going to be joining us from arise to say a few words on behalf of the organizers so welcome ben cool thank you very much um hi yeah i'm ben foley i hope you can hear me fine uh, i'm an activist and i'm a volunteer supporting arise i mean i've been involved uh, with the organisation since we started around six years ago and the numbers of people we've engaged with uh, and worked with has really increased enormously since then. We, we started with our first in-person conferences of around 
200 people uh, and, and we've grown to all our online contacts through the pandemic uh, to even larger and larger virtual attendances and we've organized in various ways but all have involved a lot of physical or technical infrastructure that allow us to organize effectively and get more people active uh, and obviously this costs us money um, so it's really important if you're able to to donate to us today um, i'm making another plea on that um, each month uh, of events that we put on the whole program of events costs hundreds of pounds to put on uh, but we know thousands of people are engaging and, and, and benefiting and, and learning uh, and getting active um, so if everyone is able uh, to everyone who is able to give 10 pounds today does so it will make a real huge difference to covering costs of zoom webinar of streaming uh, emailing lists maintaining those lists um, so please do think think about that um, we've got lots lots more events coming up in the very near future we've got the tuc demo on the 18th of june which we've just announced uh, a labor block we'd like to encourage labor activists to come and be seen uh, on the day on the 18th of june in central london we're going to hold another mobilizing rally for that block uh, on the 8th of june which will be our bringing the left together event, uh, another zoom event online and all throughout july we've got the next arise festival which i know many of you will have come along either in person or online over the last few years. Um, this is gonna be an online festival of ideas like no other. It's gonna be quite different to previous online ones we've done. Uh, it's gonna have a, a sort of a month of dozens of unique sessions with different formats. We're gonna have in-conversation events, Q and A's, uh, book launches, policy seminars, uh, and lots of other things, including film watch alongs uh, and uh, lefty lunchtime streams. So there's lots of things you can do to take part in that. Um, but again, it's going to be a, a volunteer shoestring operation, uh, which will, will cost us money. So if there's any chance you can give us something like £10 uh, or anything you can afford, uh, please do that. It makes a huge difference. The details for that should be in the chat window now. Um, but otherwise, keep coming along and keep engaging in whatever way you can. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, our next speaker, I've had the privilege of working with closely. Um, and I know what a fabulous socialist fighter she is. Um, she's also uh, the secretary of the People's Assembly. So uh, very warm welcome to Laura Pickock. Thank you so much, Gemma. It's actually been very nice just to sit and listen to all of the ideas and the contributions of the other panelists. So honestly, thank you so much. As Gemma said, I am the National Secretary of the People's Assembly and very much in the thick as an organisation of thinking about how we fight back against the political orthodoxies that are being created at the moment and other panellists have talked about them, but there being some kind of economic necessity to all of the kind of struggle and pain that is being felt in households up and down the United Kingdom. And I think it's really difficult to listen to the political leaders line up and talk about this as though it's just something that has emerged since the invasion of Ukraine, as though this is some kind of new phenomenon. We know that the cost of living crisis comes on the back of over a decade of austerity. It comes on the back of decade after decade, as Oslem talked about, of an attack on organised labour, reducing the power or an attempt to reduce the power of organised labour and the direct correlation with that and then how much people earn. So we know that how we are able to live as working class people, because at the end of the day, that's it, isn't it? It's about how we are able to actually live our lives as working class people has been diminishing year after year because of the failures of our political leaders. And really what they're asking us to do, if we think about it, is accept that there are going to be an extra, an extra 1.3 million people who will fall in an absolute poverty, including an extra 500,000 children. And let's humanise that for a second. That is about people literally running out of food, going into the cupboard and there being nothing left, going to switch the light on and the meter running out of electricity, going to put the heating on and seeing that the emergency, the, the emergency on, on your meter has ran out. Uh, uh, this is, you know, an unbearable, um, this cannot be endured 
any longer for millions of people, but it's set to get worse. Energy prices are up around £700 extra um, and rents have risen 8.6%. Nursery fees are up, council taxes up, national insurance contributions are up, food, fuel, everything has gone up but wages. Everything has gone up but those social security system payments. An absolute attack on how we are able to live our lives. And you can see it, can't you? Going through our communities right now, you can see the change in what our communities look like. You can see the queues for food banks. We are literally living through crises after crises. And it is hard to stomach because we all know on this call and people will be tuning in um, because we know it doesn't have to be like this. We know that money does exist, that the war, um, the Afghan war, for example, costs £4.5 billion per year or that, it, you know, the £12.1 billion of protective equipment that was procured by the government in 2020-2021, they wrote off £8.7 billion of it. You know, the waste is not with us. The incompetence is not with us as a working class. It lies squarely with those people who are in power. And I think that therefore we have to turn to what we do because we know things are insufferable. We know that pretty much everywhere that you go, whether it's in the supermarket queue, in the petrol station, down the pub, people are talking about how everything has got more expensive and people are not sure how things are gonna, um, are gonna be solved. I'm not sure how we're gonna come out of this crisis. And then there's sometimes a conversation about, well, we'll just have to wait and see what happens and I think that's where we all fit in because we cannot just wait and see what happens because what will happen is those food bank queues will get longer those children in absolute poverty will be increased working class pe people's wages will diminish further if there is not agitation around the core political principles at stake here and as others have said so eloquently on this call, the core political principles at stake here is in whose hands does the power lie and in whose hands does the wealth lie? And we know that the correlation between our lives getting worse and things being harder for working class people has been in direct correlation with more and more wealth being put into the hands of fewer people and more and more power being put into the hands of fewer people. And what does that mean? It means things that we used to democratically control. We used to have local authorities with, you know, some democratic functions. There used to be state ownership of utilities, of the railway, of the, you know, mail system, of our water systems. If there's anything that epitomizes the failure of privatization, in my mind, it's the privatization of water. The thing that makes up most of us, the thing that we absolutely have to have to survive privatize and what happens our service diminishes now i'm just going to move on to what we should do because i'm currently being heckled by my three-year-old who's probably having difficulties um, with youtube <laughs> that he's uh, being allowed for a bit i think it comes back to those central principles of power and wealth, doesn't it? Of course, other people have talked about the very necessary in-crisis things that must happen to alleviate the acuteness of the suffering that working class people are experiencing. But we also must be determined that the space that socialists have must not be shrunk to one where we are embarrassed about talking about power and control and wealth and of course being working class. So of course there must be controls on energy prices. Wages must be increased either by you know, state controls on wage increases, but importantly for us in the movement, workers taking control over that themselves through their industrial action and being in support of workers withdrawing their labor when they are in dispute with employers. And of course about a publicly owned energy system. We have to look at taking on that power that making sure our activism actually has an impact and that is 
not a quick win, is it? It's about building really powerful and beautiful networks inside our own, our own communities. And it's about challenging the stale political orthodoxy, in my view, of the current Labour administration, who have consistently failed, that they have consistently failed to provide a political alternative in the coronavirus pandemic, to be squarely on the side of working class people in their demands and give us the political representation we so desperately need. And so I think we have to we have to hold space, we have to put physical space back in communities, we have to contribute, debate, articulate, and then fight for an alternative society because that socialist space, you know, so missing in, in the halls, in the, in, the, in the corridors and in the chambers of Westminster has to be put back by this really strong, powerful movement on the streets and in communities. In my view, that means, and this is where I'll, I'll close, Chair, a, a reorientation away from being entrapped in frustrating and dispiriting internal wranglings of the Labour Party, the constant exasperation that I'm sure we all feel that they don't offer a credible alternative, even in the midst of a, a crisis. Let the Labour Party get on with playing those games of cat and mouse in Westminster and and we will put back and we will put all of our energy elsewhere and we'll put that energy into an organising and a fighting, confident and brave left who will build in our own communities, build power and leverage locally and nationally to fight the government and articulate uh, and a political alternative because the danger of allowing there to be such a political void in the landscape, it limits our imagination, doesn't it, as a working class to not know that actually we used to own all of these things that we're currently not able to even access is not good enough. We have to be the voice that tells that history, but also fights for a future, which is where working class class people have much more power, working class people have the power and that wealth is distributed. So love and solidarity to every single person on this call tonight. Please join the People's Assembly. We are now a membership organisation to do that, to kind of put some structure in a local organising and national organising. And just thank you very much for having me on this call. Thank you. Thanks, Laura, and thanks so much for joining us. And what a brilliant event we've had so far today with so many great speakers. And just a reminder, we only get to enjoy these events um, because of all the work of the team at Arise. Uh, so please do donate if you've got um, any money to spare so that we can keep uh, these events can keep on happening and we can keep enjoying them. Um, we've had some amazing local organising efforts put into the Q&A box. So I'm just going to read a couple of them out. But Ellen says that her, uh, her local uh, neighbourhood house has just set up a community garden and is organising free community meals for people in the neighbourhood. They're trying to tackle food insecurity. Um, the lineup for the food bank is growing and they want uh, to address the problems with local solutions, which sounds absolutely brilliant. And also Mick Gilgan from Islington Trades Council, who is organising stalls, leafleting and more for the big TUC demo in June, which is brilliant. And I hope to see lots of you there. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to, to marching with you all. Um, let's move on to our final speaker before we take some questions. Um, again, someone with, who needs very little in, introduction, um, but... Uh, someone who has helped with bringing together today's event uh, is such a vital uh, voice for an alternative with its people, health and planet first, and is still our Chancellor, the people's Chancellor. <laughs> so please welcome John McDonnell and MP. Thanks, Gemma. Um, let, me, let me thank everyone who's been involved in the organisation of, of today's event and the Arise uh, series of activities. There's a number of uns unsung heroes like Matt Wilgris and Ben Foley and Yourself, Gemma, as well, and Patrick from Ava Outlook as well. So thanks, thanks a lot, um, and all those volunteers who've helped. Um, the reason for bringing people together in this meeting and in the one that we have on June the 10th is to help mobilise for the TUC's June the 18th demonstration, um, but also in mobilising for that to ensure that we have in place a socialist strategy for dealing with the cost of living crisis that people have 
articulately, very clearly expressed this evening of its implications. Um, let me just say first about the mobilization for the 28th of June, uh, for the 18th of June. Um, it's absolutely critical that we make this a success. Um, I'm an ex-TUC bureaucrat from long ago in my youth, and so I'm trained in some of those TUC skills, which is the art of organizing meetings and demonstrations that nobody knows about and hardly anyone turns up. So that the TUC bureaucracy and the right-wing unions can then say that people aren't interested or can't be mobilized and there's no incentive to follow up demonstrations that fail like that. I think those times have changed um, and I think they've gone. And that's thanks to the hard work and determination of a, a number of general secretaries in particular, like Dave Ward at CWU, Mark Sawatka at PCS, Joe Grady at UCU, Sharon Graham at Unite, Steve Gillen at POA, Mick Whelan at ASLEF and uh, RMT, Mick at RMT, Paul Holmes at Unison and many others. And they've come together and they're developing a, a new unionism. And it's a unionism of action taking on employers and in dispute after dispute at the moment, largely unreported in our mainstream media, but disputes being won by trade unions for their members, both in protecting jobs and also protecting wages and conditions. <clears throat> and they're working collectively in a very determined form to mobilize our movement. And many of them are now discussing not just mobilizing the traditional trade union movement, but exactly as people have said here, Nabil in particular and others, that Jeremy yourself about how they then mobilize, as Laura has done, across social movements as well, bringing us together. So they've secured this demonstration in the name of the TUC and we mustn't let them down. So let's go hell for leather in organizing to build support for that demonstration. And as we, as we march, we, I think we need to be clear what we're marching for. Um, we've heard tonight wonderfully articulate speakers describing the scale of the suffering that our people are enduring as a result of the cost of living crisis. It's about the very basics of life being withdrawn from people, food, heating and shelter. I think what shocked me is some of the surveys that have been coming out. We all, as constituency MPs, we're dealing with the hard facts and hard reality of the cost of living crisis in our, our surgeries and our advice sessions. And it's tough. It's tough. And our food banks are flooded at the moment, some of them overwhelmed by the demand. But some of the first surveys have been staggering. In the recent one, 7 million adults and 3 million children missing meals each week because they, they just can't afford to eat every day. Um, energy bills so high. What's shocking, it's not just that many people can't heat their homes, they can't even turn on the cooker to cook their meals. And despite all of Johnson's promises, rents are out of control and evictions are beginning to rocket in many of our constituencies. And the interesting thing is with inflation at 9%, uh, and the real level of people's inflation already over 10% and rising, we have to recognize this is just the start of the crisis now. So we're, demar we're marching on June the 18th to demand action, um, immediate action to protect people from this economic storm. Oslam has brilliantly set out a short-term, medium-term and longer-term plan for our economy. She was one of the brilliant advisors that contributed towards the development of our manifestos in 2017 and 2019. I thought what she set out gave us a, a real perspective of it. I want to talk about the immediate demands, as I say, as we march on June the 18th. Um, we need immediate action to protect people from the economic storm. What we've seen from the Tories so far, uh, to be frank, has been 
worse than pathetically useless. And the cut of the £20 a week in universal credit was criminal. And if you remember the recent increases in tax on working people, what has angered me is that they've been accompanied by what Sunak boasted as the biggest tax relief given away to businesses in the history of this country. So what are our demands? When an economy is faced with the prospect of rising inflation, the, the standard response is to cool down demand in the economy by increasing interest rates fast and hard. And as Oslam has said, people are then left to fend for themselves to deal with the impact of the interest rate hikes. And the problem this time round is that the inflationary pressures are largely external, resulting from the COVID pandemic and the war of Ukraine. Plus, in addition to that, after 12 years of austerity and wage and benefits and pension freezes and cuts, people don't have the financial resilience to deal with an increasing cost burden contributed to by hiking up interest rates. So what's needed and what our call should be is a radical emergency programme, immediate emergency programme, to get people through the next two years at least. And there are two immediate measures, two methods, if you like. One is obvious, it's supporting people's incomes, and the other is controlling the costs that fall on them. So in terms of supporting people's incomes, um, the very basic demand must be that we inflation proof the benefit, the, the value of benefits of pensions and wages. That's the minimal demand that, that we should make in this coming period. To control costs and to control the cost burden, we've got to control the cost of essentials. And that means, yes, rent controls, effective energy price controls, but also now we need to be demanding price controls on at least a basket of the basic foodstuffs that people depend upon. And none of this, none of this is any way untoward. It's all been done in the past and elsewhere. But we always get thrown the, the question, how do we pay for this? Look, economic crises of in the past of prompted people to question how the economy works overall. And often once people see how grotesquely unfair, inefficient and incompetent our economy is and the way it operates and the way it's managed, they do demand change. So this is the opportunity we have to mobilize that demand for change. And a first step is to explain that we can pay for our emergency program. First of all, by tackling the profiteering that takes place in our casino economy so that we control prices. But in addition to that, yes, I agree with the Labour Party, a windfall tax on the energy companies is I support in principle. But actually what we need immediately, readily available to us is an excessive Profit, profits tax across the whole of our economy so that all of those are making excess profits, including, for example, the supermarket chains who are reaping in huge profit increases at the moment. All of those we should be taxing to ensure that we can pay for an emergency program to feed, heat and house our people. Can I also raise one, a couple of other areas that Oslo and others have been developing over time as well? The city of London and the finance sector continues to boom, no matter how the crisis is affecting ordinary working people. So actually the time is over right now for the financial transaction tax, the Robin Hood tax that we advocated in the last two manifestos. And in addition to that, simply taxing capital gains at the same level of income taxes, John Trickett has advocated, it would provide us the last figures from the TUC was the 17 billion needed for the social care, and there was no need therefore to hike up national insurance as the government has done. So I think this combined program of inflation proofing financial support and price controls on the basics of life, food, heating and shelter 
It's hardly revolutionary, but the Tories will resist it. And some in our movement will be too timid to support it as well. So as the cost of living crisis deepens, we cannot let the TUC demo be a one-off. What we need now is to recognize, yes, we need to mobilize for that demonstration, but our work over the coming months into the autumn and winter as this crisis gets worse, must be a rolling program of campaigning and struggle. Um, the, mobilizing the trade unions, the social movements, but you can see the groups within our society who will be hit the hardest, who I believe will, I think, automatically begin to mobilize and we've got to be alongside them. I think you'll see disabled people again coming into the fore, disabled people against the cuts, mobilizing and because it, it is disabled people who often fear, fear the worst that will hit them in the cost of living crisis. Pensioners, because of the way the government has broken their commitment on the triple lock to protect pensions. Young people in particular being hit hard by more measures from this government to, refute, to withdraw support for them. But in austerity that we've seen in the last 12 years, the heaviest burden of austerity has fallen upon women. And again, what we need to do is make sure we're on, alongside the, the women's movement, mobilising against the impact of the cost of living and the failure of government to act. But in addition to that, as we saw in the Black Lives Matter movement, there's large numbers of the BAME community now who are will, no longer willing to take it and be discriminated against and having the impact of austerity as well as the cost of living crisis fall upon them. So again, we need to be alongside the BAME community as they mobilise. But let me just throw this into the discussions that we have as well. The government realises, I think, that people will be mobilising and I think they realise that people will be angry as a result of the government's failure to support them in this cost of living crisis. And that's why they're introducing further legislation to control protests and demonstrations. On Monday night in Parliament, they're bringing forward the Public Order Bill. Effectively, what that does, it introduces measures which will treat protesters in the same way legislation treats terrorists and protesters who will be threatened with a year, in, criminalised and threatened with up to a, a year in prison. They're introducing control orders that will introduce tagging and where they can determine where people can be at any time, meetings they cannot go to or demonstrations they cannot attend or even use of the internet. These are draconian measures to control protests because I believe they know that people have had enough and that they will be in these coming months be mobilized against this government and against this failure to act as protect them. And I think we have a responsibility on our shoulders to mobilize all, all that we can, to throw ourselves into the mobilization of the later in trade union, but also linking up with the other social movements, both to ensure that we have demand a program which will protect immediately people from the cost of living crisis, but also that we campaign against the legislation that's undermining these basic civil liberties of the right to assembly and the freedom of speech. That's why what we should be organizing for now, and I think is potentially available to us, is this surge of solidarity in these coming months where we can in many ways ensure that we use every mechanism we possibly can to protect people against the cost of living crisis, protect them against the reactionary legislation the government is coming forward, but also build a huge massive social left block that will enable us to implement many of those policies as we go into the, after the next election into government, many of those policies that Oslom and other economists have brought forward to transform our economy in the interests of working people. Solidarity. On solidarity. Um, but thank you for joining us today. Um, we just have a little bit of time for it. We've had so we have quite a few questions in, but uh, I've just picked out four of them. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read them out, and then if um, we've got four um, panelists left, if you'd like to come in and respond to any of them or what you feel is important, that'd be really great. Before we finish up for the day. So, okay, I've got an anonymous question. Um, someone sent by Zoom asking, how do you think the vested interest in not changing so powerful to date 
in widening the inequality gap for decades, can be wrestled from the 1% and still have something that functions and doesn't fall apart, as the vested interests would have us believe. We probably largely agree on what, but uh, need to do better uh, to understand some possible hows. And then we've got a question from Ben in South London uh, from, via Facebook saying, public sector workers have suffered 12 plus years of wage freezes and restraint. How do we build the case to not only keep up with inflation, but also rebuild their lost pay? And another question from Zoom from Helen. Um, I'm not saying abolish tax credits, but do they encourage some employers to pay less and therefore subsidise low wages? Mm. And finally, all I know is there an Arsenal fan from Islington um, who says polling data consistently shows great public support for policies such as greater public ownership and progressive taxation, including amongst conservative voters. How can we ensure the left's voice is heard in this debate, given the hostile media and political climate? Uh, if I go in the order people spoke, so people have a bit of a break. So, um, Oslam, would you like to come back and respond? Yeah, uh, if I may take the public sector pie, uh, I'm in a uh, sector where we are losing young lecturers because of uh, year after year uh, having uh, zero pay rise or even uh, 0.5, 1% every year after uh, year after year below inflation for uh, more than a decade now since the Great Recession, really. Uh, the, uh, the public sector uh, is in a similar situation. I mean, we have been having uh, years of uh, strikes, uh, very successful ballots. Uh, I, I don't see uh, any, any other alternative if uh, there is uh, to have still a public sector or at the universities lecturers continuing. Uh, I mean, these sectors will bleed uh, workers. So actually, there is no choice but to eventually accept that uh, past 10 years lost real income has to be uh, paid. It's not going to happen automatically. Um, and uh, it isn't uh, as rosy as uh, I might have sounded, but um, I often go to the picket line and I say I had the best you know, time of my life. It is really very empowering um, to be able to get together and say enough is enough. Uh, obviously from the rallies together with uh, other unionists and social movements and people's assembly, uh, to community uh, unions, I'll be talking to Unite uh, in uh, a week time. Um, we need to build that confidence uh, that Yes, it is the time uh, to ask for, uh, well, a pay rise to cover the lost decade, uh, but also, as John has been saying today, to now start talking about uh, the, the, the next uh, attack from the price rises. Um, how do we do that? It is about organizing yet one more colleague at the workplace, calling one more colleague to send that ballot, uh, I mean, against all odds with the new trade union act, we have managed to uh, build uh, the industrial action in uh, more than half of our universities. Uh, that is um, how it happens. And it's a bit like reaching a critical mass, I think. Once uh, enough unions, enough workers in a union and enough different unions in different sectors pass those very uh, aggressive uh, ballot thresholds strike and some of us uh, you know, uh, win uh, some successes in some cases. Uh, eventually, I think more people see that this is uh, the way to go. And uh, of course, public sector is very important because it's a signal for the rest of the private sector as well. So. Uh, if, if we can't uh, win it in the public sector where the union is also uh, relatively stronger, we are not under the same pressures as the dodgy self-employment contracts or zero hours contracts, not to the same extent at least as the uh, other private uh, sector. So uh, I am cautiously optimistic. I'm loving the optimism. Um, 
Shall I move on um, to Nabila? Great, thank you. Um, so, sorry, I'm just very quickly reading through some of the questions again. Okay. Um, I think to add to what Oslam said, it can be quite disheartening, I suppose, when we, you know, when we're organising and when we turn up to calls, when we turn up to rallies and when we put in the effort, uh, but we don't see immediate shifts in policy or, you know, an immediate shift in government. Um, but we know that, you know, things we enjoy now, whether that's the NHS or the weekend, um, was won through the working class sort of persevering in our efforts. And I think in a lot of ways, hope is a prerequisite for change. Um, and I truly, truly believe that everyone in some capacity or another is an organiser. And that is ultimately the only way we can win, right? Whereas they have the press on their side, they have um, endless amount of resources and this incredible networks with, you know, all of the elites are essentially linked up with each other. All we have is each other. And I think we can't underestimate the power of coming together, you know, whether that's in our unions, in our workplaces, whether that's in our community centres, whether that's having conversations with your neighbours, um, I don't know, talking to the person behind you in the right line of the co-op, like whatever it is, it's those conversations, it's those, yeah, it's just that coming together um, is what will ultimately win us the world that we, we dream of. So, you know, and I think a lot of the times when we talk about organising, when we talk about change, when we talk about anything like that, there's this idea that it has to be really big. It has to be hundreds of thousands of people in Trafalgar Square, or it has to be loads and loads of people out on the street chanting. And, you know, yes, all of those are very, very important. It's important to show up in numbers, but I think organising can sometimes be quite unglamorous. It can be, you know, the, whoever's doing the tech on this call, um, you know, the people who are using whatever skills they have to channel that into some sort of good. Um, and I think all of that, doing all of that unpaid labour um, in whatever capacity, whether that's in our homes or wherever else, all of that is organising. And I think ultimately that is the only way we can come out to show our support um, for, for left projects by supporting left initiatives and supporting each other. Thanks, Amina. That was so well said. I completely agree. Um, really inspiring as well. Um, our last, uh, lastly, um, John, do you come in and respond to those questions? Yeah, I thought Nabil hit, hit the nail on the head. That was superb. Um, I want, I want to say this: that there's a, the objective reality intrudes in this situation, and the objective reality is that we're faced with an economic crisis whereby, as I said, some of the people's, the basics of people's lives are being threatened. And if you look at the projections for the next six to 12 months, um, much as I dread it, things are gonna get significantly worse. This level of inflation, and we haven't even seen the worst of it yet, really has severe consequences for so many of our people. That's the objective reality that is intruding on people's lives. And it's like any basic psychology, really. It's, it's that fight or flight reaction. And often what happens is, is that the flight reaction is just to hide and try and shy away from it. But also there's another reaction, which is the fight reaction, which is people think, I'm really angry about this. We need something done. And that's when there's the potential for mobilization. And the key issue for us on the left as socialists is to make sure that mobilization comes from the left. And that means making sure that we look at the organizational forms that we can launch to channel that anger into constructive and engaging with change itself, transformative change. Um, one of the ways we do that is to make sure we channel that anger into our traditional organizational forms, like the trade union movement, the Labour Party, et cetera. But also it's how we creatively work with new movements that are being formed and that where people are coming together in natural, their natural associations. And the other way in which we channel it is making sure that we provide 
at least the opportunity for a discussion of the a credible alternative and that's our role at the moment so and that work is being done so exhilaratingly you know, the housing crisis we now have a whole range of groups like the renters union actually saying we can solve this housing crisis we know how we do it the first step is rent controls the second step is ending landlordism the third step is making sure we're building social housing council housing so we, we there's an opportunity the tragedy of this current situation means many people are suffering, but actually the opportunity is there now to actually use that suffering and turn it into a real anger about an exposure of the system that mobilizes for transformative change. In the old days, we used to study um, in science, Kern's theory of scientific revolutions. And it basically brings together the, the whole concept of that. What happens is, as I mentioned it, you build up a mass that then gets to a tipping point and then things change over overnight virtually. And I think what's happening here is the potential of building up of mass of people who are really angry, but then understand how the system is not working for them. And that, that mass then gets to a tipping point of change, the demand for change. And I think that's the potential of the coming period. The key thing is to make sure that we're harnessing that movement to demand socialist change. Final point that was made on, on the media this is the best time we've ever had in terms of the media. And I'll tell you why. Because actually, people, all the surveys are demonstrating 40 to 50 percent of people now no longer get their information from the mainstream media. They get it from social media and elsewhere. And that means that actually the, the, the right wing corporate oligarch owned social uh, media that there is in terms of the mainstream media actually has less influence now than ever. So that gives us the opportunity of creatively using every mechanism we possibly can through social media and elsewhere to get our message across and to mobilize people. But final point on that as well, the real world does eventually even intrude on the BBC. The BBC has had to report the scale of suffering that there is in terms of the surveys of people and children going without food, the rise in evictions, all of that. And even, even there, I think it shows you just how the climate is changing, the potential is for climate of opinion. So I'm optimistic, but the most important thing is the old Gramsci thing, isn't it? A pessimism of the uh, pessim what is it? Pessimism, in intellect, optimism. The will always work on the basis, though, that the we have to demonstrate the political will to mobilise that change, and that's why this coming period, I think, you'll find could be the one of the most politically exciting in this country for a long period of time. Thanks so much, John. <laughs> A huge thanks to, to all our speakers and panellists today uh, and to everybody who's been visiting, um, who's been watching for participating so much and asking lots of questions and posting your comments. It's been great. Um, <clears throat> and I also want to say just a huge thanks um, to the whole Arise team, Patrick, Matt, Ben, and, and I know so many others, the whole volunteer team for everything you do, setting this up and, and all the other voluntary work you do. Um, and I think our key message from today is that to all those people um, who are on the who are fighting uh, and will be fighting in the months ahead against Tory attacks on our health, on our rights, on our livelihoods, that we stand with you, and we're here to offer you a platform to keep the, uh, up the fight against Boris Johnson and the Tories. And where the Labour front bench won't take the fight to the Tories, we collectively will, and we must do it anyway. And we'll put forward the socialist solutions to the crisis that we need. Um, and moving forward, we know just how important our campaign against the Tories reactionary agenda is. And our work in Labour for socialist policies and party democracy must go alongside this. So please do take on board all the action links that you've had in the chat during this um, event tonight, uh, including donating to the link provided so that these events can continue to happen. And um, do follow all the social media, uh, all the media partners, you've got Labour Outlook, uh, plus supporting the Workers' Can't Wait petition and supporting the People's Assembly. And do please come to the June TUC demo um, and protest. And I'm looking forward to seeing lots of you there um, and that amazing coming together and solidarity. And we must build resistance to the Tories and popularise socialist solutions. So let's do it together. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming along tonight. <laughs>